This is Dawn of the Infinite Murazon's Rise Masterclass. This is for Dragonflight Season 3 Mythic Plus. Today, I'll cover everything you need to know to ace this dungeon from a tyrannical and fortified weak perspective. You can see for the very first pool here, I basically tag all these mobs together. And let's just pause the frame here and talk about the mobs in the first pool. The very first thing you notice is that it consists of four mobs that are marked as teal in color. And if you use my plater profile that's free in the description, these are mobs that do a frontal. They are doing this ability called Rending Clee. And this basically puts a bleed on whoever is standing in front of the mobs. So be very careful of that. If you're melee DPS, make sure you're positioned behind those mobs. And then you have the Magus here that's marked in pink in color. It does Epoch Bolt, single target cast. It's a good to kick. And basically you just need to be aware of that. By the way, it did try to cast Corroding Volley and you can see we instantly stunned that. Um, that's the other dangerous ability that the Magus does that you ideally want to try and stop. Um, like the name suggests, a Volley basically ends up doing damage on everyone else in the party. So uh, that's something to take note of. You will see the Magus in the next pool anyway. Uh, but yeah, just be careful of the Vanguard as a tank, right? How you position them, make sure you don't uh, stack bleeds, which is basically this debuff on people. Um, and you can see like, if um, you know, you're not careful, you can end up with lots of stacks. So just be careful of that. Then we have a new mob here, the Keeper, right? So this Keeper here casts something called Temporal Strike. And what it does is it summons all these Swirlies on the ground that you just need to move out of. If you fail to move out of it, see what happens here? You actually get knocked up in the air. You guys also saw the Magus Corrupting Volley there, and we managed to stun that in time. That was why it was marked in light purple, right? On my plater, that signifies you need a crowd control to stop the corroding volley. It cannot be interrupted, but you need a crowd control for that. And the Vanguard I've already covered. There's one more ability you need to be very careful about, is Titanic Bulwark. The moment you see this Keeper cast Titanic Bulwark, it's your job to bring all the mobs outside of the bubble. Because any mob that stands within the bubble takes 50% less damage. Obviously, that's not ideal at all. Other than that, these uh, mobs, they don't really do anything new. So I'm just going to forward here. Uh, we tagged in another Vanguard that you've already seen before. So I'm just going to forward all these mobs. You've already seen them. The next pool, you'll see something new here, right? The Maiden. So this Maiden is a new mob. And let's cover that. The reason why she's marked as, um, you know, Teal in color is because she does Ancient Radiance. This is unavoidable AoE damage, the Ancient Radiance cast. Um, and then she does this ability called Orb of Contemplation. You can see that she's turning around and she's basically facing the chamois here, right? Notice this Orb of Contemplation and what it does. It fires an orb that travels outwards and then it boomerangs backwards, right? So you need to be very careful. Like most people will just dodge the frontal, but forget that this orb actually travels backwards onto the Maidens itself. So the Maiden will do like the Radiance and then Orb of Contemplation out and then you'll come back in. I would say this orb is just, you know, something dangerous that you need to be aware of when it comes back in. Some people actually don't see it. So that's the Maiden. All right, then we go around and we pull these mobs. Um, you have seen all these mobs, the Vanguard and the Magasus. So I'm just going to forward this pack. You know exactly what they do now. Um, just make sure you CC the Corrupting Volley. It's really important. All right, then we have a brand new mob in the next pool. It's the Sentinel. The Sentinel is marked as a caster in my plater and you'll see shortly why. It's very dangerous. All right, so... This Sentinel, as I play the footage here, you see it does something called Shrouding Sandstorm. And the reason why it's marked as a red cast bar is that it's actually a frontal. You can see where it's currently pointing, right? The Sentinel is pointing northwards. It's going to charge out shortly. You can see it charges out, so don't be in its path. But at the same time, the moment it charges out, it shrouds itself in this Sandstorm and it starts gripping a player towards it. You can see um, it does Binding Grubs. The thing is, you cannot actually interrupt the Sentinel from range here because the Shrouding Sandstorm actually kind of is like some form of line of sight effect. So you actually need to run into the field and then you interrupt manually because if not, you can see that it's currently dragging the Shammy, right? And the Shammy is obviously taking damage within the Sandstorm. So you need to help your allies interrupt this mob here. You can see mine is on cooldown, so I couldn't interrupt it, right? So anyway, someone else interrupted that. But yeah, you're supposed to run in and interrupt the mob. Um, actually, no, I think the Shammy died because we didn't interrupt fast enough, so... That's something to take note of. Make sure you interrupt fast. Um, you can see it doing it again. Now I'm prepared, right? So I run out, I roll over, and I interrupt it over here. That's the way you stop the cast, and then you bring it out of the sandstorm again. And you can see the volley going off from the Magus there. Just because we didn't stun it, you can see everyone taking half um, of their health gone. So it's kind of dangerous. Um, other than that, the Sentinel just rinses and repeats. So that's pretty much it. You've seen all these Vanguards. You've seen all the Maguses. I'm just going to forward. Um, nothing to talk about here. Then we have the first boss once you've cleared out the entire area, right? So let's talk about uh, the boss in chronological order here. This is the first boss of the dungeon. All right, so the Keeper tier. What do we need to do here? Um, firstly, 
I prefer tanking the boss, uh, facing only the tank, everyone stacks up on his butt. Um, it does this thing called Spark of Tear, and you will see very shortly, he will mark two random people in your party with debuffs. Right, you can see going out right here, the Shammy and the Paladin. The way you want to deal with this as a healer is you instantly dispel one of them first, and you spot heal the other one with the debuff remaining. The reason is because you don't want the debuff to time out at the same time. Right now, they're both at 17 seconds. This is because when you remove one of the debuffs, it instantly does splash damage to everyone. So you don't want them to time out at the same time, which is why you saw the druid basically dispelling the paladin first. Meanwhile, we will spot heal the sham here, right? And, um, and the boss does this overlap. You can see the shammy having this AoE circle around it. This is basically when it times out, whoever is in the circle itself will take damage. The boss does dividing strike, like the name suggests it needs to be soaked by more than one person. If you do not soak with two people or more, the boss will gain a stacking buff that increases its damage done throughout the entire fight. So always soak. Dividing strike, you can see everyone coming in to soak, right? So that's great. And after the dividing strike, um, you have the next ability called Titanic Blow. So firstly, know that this is targeted on the tank and it does a knockback. So if you have your back facing the edges of the room, you will get knocked off the platform. So always ensure there's like room, right? So I transcend this back here, right? And I just moved out of it. Also, it leaves this concentrated kind of ground um, that you need to move out of. It also does infinite annihilation where it does this Kono, Kono bad, move out of it. Also move out of all the AOE, this common sense stuff. And shortly after, you know, the boss will kind of transition um, into the intermission, but just make sure you don't ever get knocked off by that Titanic blow. You can see ops are coming in one second. That's the intermission. Siphon of Stone. At this point in time, the boss will basically just RP. So during this time, the boss will basically channel some form of like shield on itself, as you can see over here. At the same time, you have all these ops that will start spawning around the room that tries to get towards the middle pillar. And you want to try and intercept all these ops that are flying to the middle of the room that touches this pillar here. Because the more ops that touches the pillar, the larger the shield uh, that the boss will gain. So ideally, you basically intercept everything. Not only that, everything that you intercept gives you a stacking buff that gives you more haste. So naturally, DPS uh, specs, you probably want to hold on to the haste. Uh, that will be pretty useful for ensuring you have good DPS. Um, you can see another spark of tear. You can see the druid instantly dispelling himself. We leave it basically on the demon hunter, right? And the demon hunter basically um, just needs to be spot heal. And it's as simple as that. Um, you can see finally, uh, finally the debuff times out on the demon hunter and everything's A-OK, -okay, transcend us back. And rinse and repeat. After that, the boss does everything you've seen already. Um, I like to tank the boss on the edges of the room so that we try and keep these puddles clean away from the middle of the room. That's um, essentially how I play it. So that's that. Um, after you finish the first boss, you would run up the ramp here, right? And this is where you will spawn, um, you know, the mini boss before you enter the gauntlet, the gauntlet that everyone dreads. Forwarding here, right? You can see RP, the dragons are flying down, right? Um, dragon lands, some more RP, right? Um, and then you have this Marauder and the Watchkeeper. So let's talk about it, right? What do these mobs actually do? You can see the Marauder, obviously a caster, big mark in pink. The dragon will basically do this thing called Timeless Curse, which will spawn swirlies on the ground. You just need to make sure you dodge them. The Marauder does something called Displace Chrono Sequence which deals like AoE damage if it goes off um, and it kind of grants allies a shield. Long story short, make sure you interrupt that. The Marauder also does Infinite Schism. Infinite Schism is basically an AoE ability and coupled with this Infinite Fury, there will be a lot of pulsing AoE damage. So this is a very good time for your healers to actually be using um, any form of healing cooldowns, right? So um, it's just something to be very wary of. I would say the Dragon is generally a good place to ensure all healing cooldowns are being used and rotated. You can see this Infinite Fury absolutely trucks uh, people over here. So um, yeah, healers beware and everyone please coordinate cooldowns and health stones and whatnot. Um, just take note of that. Um, after you kill the mini bosses, then the gauntlet will open. And this gauntlet is um, known to be quite the puck slayer. So you can see after some RP, right? Then all these opens and you're supposed to dash all the way to the end. Um, if not, you will be basically sent back all the way to the start, which is very unfortunate. So, so let me show you the proper way it's done, right? Using this POV. Um, ideally, you want to try and hug to the side. I always find it faster and easier to just dodge to the side. Um, and then you just make all the way uh, through to the side. Try and hug right. Um, and if you are able to hug to the sides, I don't think generally you need to slow down. Obviously, faster reactions will help here. 
Um, any form of like MS speed buff will also help. You run all the way to the end, and then what you do is you basically run over to this rift of stability. You click on the rift and you'll start channeling, right? Once it reaches 100%, it means that you open the portal for your allies to use. And what does that mean? So assuming you finish channeling on the portal, anyone else on the other side, the start of the gauntlet can basically click on this and basically you'll be teleported right to the end of the gauntlet where you wait for two mini bosses to spawn before they unlock the following um, next phase of the entire dungeon. So over here, you can see the dragons landing, right? One of them is basically the saboteur. One of them is basically this mob called the diversionist. All right, so let's talk about them. Firstly, the saboteur does timeless curse, basically dodge AOE, right? You have this thing called timeless curse on a diversionist again, again, dodge AOEs. And then I think it's supposed to do bronze exhalation. That is why this is being marked in teal because it does a frontal called bronze exhalation. The targets on the tank is a Kono, don't stand on the tanks, as simple as that. Then you have Infinite Fury. You've already seen what Infinite Fury does in the previous mobs. It basically pulses AOE damage. Great time for your healers to be using cooldowns. And that's pretty much all these mobs, right? They just rinse and repeat from here on. Um, lots of AOE damage from the Infinite Fury. So healers beware. Um, dodge the corner of the dragons and you should be A-OK. -okay. Once you kill those two dragons, this entire space opens up for you. All right, so what the hell is going on here? You see a ton of sand on the ground and the objective is simple. You basically want to pull all these mobs and you want to kill these mobs on top of the sand because every time they die, there's an on-death effect that clears the sand on the ground. Let's talk about some of the mobs, right? Some of them are from the lower dungeon as well. Triple Strike, which is a tank buster. So yeah, you get the point, right? So Triple Strike, just be careful. They are tank busters. You can see I'm trying to move them onto the sand to try and kill them because when you kill them on the sand, it's actually like you can see, right? On death, they basically clear some of the sands for you. And your goal is just to keep tagging things in. Um, I basically range tag the Rift Mage, hoping that, you know, we have range kicks here that we actually will kick uh, the mob in. But anyway, uh, the idea is that you want to try and kick uh, the mob means anyway i decided to just roll out and just kick the guy um it does something called infinite burn that kind of hurts right um so make sure you kick that it does temporal blast as well a single target so naturally it's a caster just be very careful of that um and yeah like that's what the rift mage does so let's talk about this infinite burn right what the hell does it do it's actually it does arcane damage to the target it also puts a movement speed debuff on the target so ideally you interrupt this um it can be you know pretty annoying you can see like uh, the chamois was basically taking away there, right? From the debuff. So just take note of that. And then you have the anomaly. You folks have also seen the anomaly. It's marked in teal because it actually does a frontal. I'm just trying to turn it around. Um, oh, and you saw Bloom as well. So Bloom also from the lower dungeon. You guys know exactly what to do. The moment Bloom goes out, you want to try and dispel it ASAP, right? Currently it's on the tank and on the demon hunter. Essentially, the debuff has the ability to copy all the nasty effects onto someone else in the party. So you want to dispel ASAP. You can see the... Healer basically dispelled me as the tank. Um, that's how you deal with that. And you just let um, the party just be very wary of this untwist, which is the frontal that everybody needs to dodge. It's really important. Um, and every time, like, you know, the ads die again, like they explode and they clear more sand. So you need to position them as a tank. Um, so yeah, it's a bit tedious, but the idea is that you want to clear all the way to those portals in the distance. And you guys have already seen this mob, so I'm just gonna forward. But the idea is that you see all these people channeling stuff on the portals, you wanna clear uh, to all that position there. So um, always positioning mobs such that you clear as much sand as possible. I am looking at all the mobs and trying to see like if there's any mobs that are new. No, there are no new mobs. You've seen the Rift Mage. Um, yeah, so it's standard stuff, right? All I'll say is that you just wanna keep clearing um, to the portal, so nothing new here. I've already talked about all the mobs. Just note that it's actually really painful to stand in the sand, as you guys can see from me dashing into the sand there. So ideally, you want to make sure that your healer's got your back when you're doing something like that as a tank. Uh, range DPS should be on the lookout to help your your tank basically range interrupt those rift mages in. Um, that way, they can get to stuff fairly safe. You can see once you clear all the mobs, this thing activates. I'm currently at the 2 p.m. 2 o'clock position on the minimap and basically the portal then activates and it flies you all the way to the next destination. There's a couple of ways, right? You can do the bosses in different orders, but this is just what we uh, decided to do. Um, actually, you can do it in a couple of different orders. Just take note of that. Um, and then you land here and you have all these um, flying like stingrays that is basically called a chrono axi and the pendule mobs. And you can see like over here, the pendules, they do time beam that is interruptible. 
and the Chronexy. So this Chrono Eruption, right? Basically just target someone and it puts this AoE swirly on the ground. Make sure you move away from it. If you fail to move away from it, you get stunned. Essentially, that's what it does. Um, and then you have Time Beam, which obviously um, you just need to make sure you try and interrupt. Um, dodge all the swirlies on the ground. Um, and then you can see Temporal Lignance trying to go off. So Temporal Link is just like a fancy way of an absorb shield that they are trying. Um, long story short, it links to someone the Demon Hunter. And the amount of absorb shield you need to break through is dependent on the healing that is being done to the Demon Hunter here and the damage that is being done to the Chronexy. Long story short, if you basically continue to play the mob as per what it is, you can see the shield here. The shield will eventually be broken, right? You can see the heal absorb the Demon Hunter, just heal the Demon Hunter. And then you just do DPS to the Chron XC, and then eventually the shield and the link will break. It's as simple as that, right? You can see the link being broken here after you basically punch through the absorb shield. Um, as simple as that, right? It's just a fancy way of building an absorb shield um, that is new that they're trying, I think. And then just dodge the Chrono Eruption. Yeah, Chrono Eruption, that's what it's called. Anyway, you come over to this like time loss battlefield site. Um, and depending on whether you are Alliance or Horde, the mobs might look different, but they all have the same abilities, right? And maybe they have some variation in their names, but it's gonna be exactly the same mechanic. So, uh, the first thing it does is like vehicle mota. It basically targets people with this or like orange swirlies. Just move, kind of common sense. Um, and then you have all these like sappers. You can see these things like that will run to you, and it says kaboom. That's why they're channeling, right? Also, obviously, stay away from them. Uh, you drop crowd control abilities, assaults, ring. Very helpful. Um, and that's pretty much for this first vehicle, right? I don't think it does anything new. Yeah, just forwarding here. They don't do anything new. After you kill the first vehicle, there'll be more mobs that spawn before the boss finally spawns, right? Uh, and in this case, you have a fast here mob, right? This is a um, custom mob. Um, it does something called Earthquake and like the name suggests move out of the AOE abilities. Um, and I believe you need to interrupt Rallying Cry when it does cast. Oh, by the way, uh, don't ask me why the mobs bug, but this is, yeah. Um, yeah, the mobs were bugging. Anyway, that's like rallying shot that you need to kick alongside healing wave that I marked as an important kick. So it's really important. Um, and that's pretty much it. Like the mobs don't do much. Make sure you kick the healing wave and you should be Gucci. Uh, rallying shot, ideally you kick that too, right? Don't let them buff themselves. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna forward here. It don't do much. And eventually the boss will spawn after you kill all these ads. In this case, uh, this is the boss for us. We're fighting Hell Scream. You can fight. The Alliance version 2, they do exactly the same thing. The first thing that it will do is basically this thing called Decapitate, which is on the tank, a tank buster, right? So firstly, it's like a Moto Strike ability. It results in you doing less healing received as a tank. So ideally, when that goes off, you want to pop some form of defensive. In this case, I use Celestial Brew. And then it will do Shockwave, right? A Kono Shockwave, a first one, a second one um, that you have to dodge in sequence and up until the third uh, Shockwave, right? And then after that, you will summon ads, right? So regardless of whether you're Alliance or Horde and whatever you're fighting, there will always be one melee, which is the Grunt. There'll be one Caster, which is the Warlock. And there'll be a range ad that is the Thrower. Or it can be the Archer or something else in the Alliance version. So the point is you want to tank everything on the range ad because the range ad can't be moved, right? Unless you have a DK and you can grip it. So you want to interrupt the Caster. You want to pick up aggro on the melee, DPS, and you just run everything onto the range ad so that it can be cleaved down with the rest of the ads. You can see the boss is doing blade storm. It hurts a hell lot. Don't get, basically don't eat the blade storm. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, after that, the boss just rinses and repeat, right? So it can be intensive towards the end um, because there's just a lot of damage going out, right? Um, and then you can see all these ads, right? What I'll say about these ads is that um, you ideally want to try and kick everything. That can be dangerous. Uh, you can see the thrower there just like simply like happily throwing things um, at the party members. Um, that could be something that you know, could add up in terms of damage. But other than that, I think the boss really doesn't do much. Um, it's just intensive to heal because there's a lot of like uh, damage going out. You can see this like serrated axe and whatnot like goes out. It's pretty painful, right? You can see this huge amount of damage. Basically plays a bleed on the Demon Hunter here. So you will take down over time. So yeah, it's intensive to heal alongside this Mortal Strike debuff. So um, just beware as a healer. Like this could be an intensive fight for you. But the mechanics are really simple. So... Um, I wouldn't cover it in too much detail because I literally, that's all you need to know. It's just that execution and throughput is a whole different thing. So you have all these pendules that are flying, right? So after we finish the time loss battlefield, you can see that we are running um, from where, uh, there's opposite to where we arrived to fight the time loss battlefield. You can see I'm pulling all these um, pendule mobs. 
they don't do that much. They just do time beam that is good to be interrupted if possible. Uh, but yeah, you can AoE all of them. There's a lot of swirlies on the ground, so be very careful. I think one of the best ways is you just group up and you move together. Um, if you're an organized group, in. if you're not, just kind of dodge the swirlies, range CC, um, and basically crowd CC, sorry, group CCs, and you should be A-OK. -okay. And then you take the portal and you will fly back all the way um, to, onto the next platform. So anyway, you would then land on the north side of this entire crossroads. This will be familiar to you. North from the mini map, by the way. And what you need to do is to basically head down to the middle, like what I'm doing right over here. And then you want to head south, right? You want to head south, which is basically crossing over to the other side, opposite side where you arrive from. And you want to try and take the portal um, to the next destination, right? So the moment you touch the portal, you'll be transported on a dragon. So let me just forward this bit. Um, and then you would land over here on a brand new platform. Um, you know it's a new platform when there's like ads patrolling at the start, right? So um, let's talk about this mob here, the Time Bender, right? So the moment you um, basically engage the Time Bender, you see these ads that spawn um, from the little portal. So let's talk about all of them here in detail. The Rocketeer does something called Staticky Punch. This is just a tank buster, so um, make sure you have mitigation. It does something called Electro Juice Giga Blast. That obviously sounds bad. This is something you can stop with a stun, by the way, but you can, you can see it. that's basically what I did. If you don't stop it with a stun though, it's basically something you can move out of. It's like a frontal. And then you have this like rocket boat volley that I'm just going to play back for you. So take note of the rocket tier here. It does something called rocket boat volley. This is a dangerous ability, hence marked as orange to kick. Volley always sounds bad. Um, you notice that this time banner casts Millennium 8. And look who he's casting it upon. It's on the rocket tier. So anyway, what it does is that it starts channeling onto an ally and then the ally will start pulsing damage. And that's pretty much what it does. So just take note of that. Um, just rewinding here, you want to try and interrupt dizzying sands. Long story short, it inflicts damage. It also causes like a disorienting kind of effect. Always kick that. Um, and I believe that's pretty much all the abilities you need to know from all these new mobs. There's a couple of new ones, right? Um, but the rocket boat wall is the most important. You want to try and stun the Giga Blast. If you don't stun the Giga Blast, yeah, the arrow bot will just channel a cone also. You can don't interrupt with a stun as well and just simply move out of it. Um, the aerobot does bombing run where you see all these um, orange swirlies. You just need to get the hell away from them. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's all these abilities already. I've already covered them all. So I'm just going to skip. And we'll now talk about everyone's maybe most hated boss in this dungeon called Mochi. And Mochi is nerfed already, by the way. So um, it's going to be way easier than what you see in this video. Um, I think they, they made it way easier to spot the real Mochi. Okay, if you sound confused, let me explain. Chronologically, when you pull Mochi, uh, she does something called Sand Blast. Sand Blast is a frontal, like the name suggests. Uh, make sure you have no one behind you and nobody stands on the tank, very important. Um, and then it does this thing called More Problems, where basically Mochi would spawn all these Mochi clones and you need to find the real Mochi, okay? Basically, how do you spot who the real Mochi is? The real Mochi is the one with the bright blue hair that the original Mochi has when you first engage that mochi because that mochi is real, right? So I'm looking for the bright blue hair. You can see like immediately when I turn around, okay, I notice it. This is the mochi with bright blue hair. How do you know that this is the one? Well, if you look at these mob and these mobs, they don't have bright blue hair, right? Obviously you can like hide all your UI and just zoom in and you can see better. Uh, but the point is after this um, whole channel of dragon's breath, only the real mochi will transform into a dragon and do dragon's breath. And that's why you need to identify which is the real mochi by spotting the hair color, right? Um, the hair is always in light blue. If it has any form of ornaments that is on its head that's not light blue, that is the fake mochi, right? So find the mochi with no head ornaments and someone that you can see clearly the light blue hair of mochi. Um, it then spawns this thing called time traps. And the reason why time traps are necessary is because all those traps are needed to resolve the next mechanic. You can see it does something called familiar faces. So what does familiar faces does? It basically spawns for everyone a clone that will fixate onto them. You can see this red line here. The idea is that you want to position yourself such that between where the clone is that's fixated on you and where you are as a player, there is a pile of sand that you can use or trap, pile of trap that you can use to disrupt um, the ad. You can see as this ad comes in over here, it runs into a trap, it dies whenever an ad runs into a trap, it explodes, but it also does party-wide damage. So if your party is low, everyone's not topped up, and everyone explodes all their ads at the same time, you're going to wipe. So there's a bit of control involved. And then all these chaos emits, 
you will also have uh, Mochi then split up again to try and channel, right? So you can see over here, this Mochi here has a crown, right? So this is not the real Mochi. And, and over here, this Mochi has a hat, a wizard's hat, right? So you can see the, the dark brown hat. So that's not the real Mochi either. So the idea is you want to try and find the real Mochi. Where's the real Mochi? You can see over here, you can actually see her light blue hair over here on Skull. So that's why you hide behind Skull and it's completely safe, right? So it rinses and repeats from here. And what I'll say about Mochi is that actually if you have less players, this fight is actually way easier to do. Why? Because all these exploding traps is what's causing the healer not to be able to catch up. And while the healer is running around doing this mechanic, um, you know, damage goes out and they, they basically can't heal, right? Um, and that's pretty much it, right? I think so. That's it. Yeah. So watch the samplers, don't stand on people. Uh, Mochi does no pro more problems. This is when you need to kind of find a real Mochi again. This is an exercise, right? When you're trying to find a real Mochi, I find it. I quickly mark, I quickly uh, basically marked it as Skull so everyone can flock over to me and they know this is the safe zone to burn some B-Reses there, but that's pretty much it, right? Um, so that's that. If you're able to do all those things, Mochi eventually falls over and die. And now we are heading to the final boss. So after we kill Mochi, then obviously you can run uh, to the start of the platform. Uh, in this case, we are running to the north of the platform, right? And we're taking the portal back in search of the final boss, right? So you can see we're all on dragons here. I'm going to forward a little. You can see that we land here back on the crossroads on the south side, which is where we headed to fight Mochi. Now, where do you go next? You come to the middle of the crossroads in the minimap. And then what you want to do is you want to head to the east, which is where we are going right now. So I'm just going to fall a little. Once you touch the teleporter, you'll be on a dragon and you'll be transmuted or rather transported all the way to this IC entrance. Looks familiar. Yes, it's because it's from the lower dungeon as well. So I'm just going to forward here. Uh, there's a bit of like um, RP that's involved. You can see them channeling the beam, activating the portal, and then that allows you to run through, which is perfect. Uh, you come down, you run through, and then you come down, you realize that, oh, all the mobs that you previously had to kill on lower is now gone. Now to be replaced with brand new mobs that you need to deal with. Uh, so let's talk about that. All right, so you can see after some RP, there'll be some mobs that spawn from the portal. And this is very important. In this pool, there's two marauders, right? And both marauders are casters. It's very important that you assign one melee kick to each marauder. And in fact, I will even assign backup kicks. So in this case, I assigned it as Skull. Obviously, I'm going to take Skull. At the same time, you have a Slayer kind of dragon that you have to deal with. Let's talk about it in chronological order. The first thing that the Marauder does, displays Chrono Sequence. Displays Chrono Sequence, a must kick. It does AoE damage. Basically, just make sure you kick that. Try and assign kicks. Um, for example, I'm grabbing Skull. Someone else needs to grab the other mob. It goes off here. You can see what happens. Everyone takes massive AoE damage. At the same time, it puts an Absorb Shield on itself and its allies, right? So very dangerous, right? Always make sure you kick. And it just makes the fight way harder um, when you have all these AoE abilities. At the same time, you have the Slayer that does Bronze Exhalation. It's a Kono on the tank. Make sure you dodge. Uh, but the idea is that you always want to kick and you want to try and burn down one Marauder um, down ASAP. But always assign one person each to kick the mobs over here. It's really, really critical. Um, if you basically can interrupt them appropriately, the mobs will eventually die. So I'm just going to forward here. Uh, Infinite Fury, again, is where you use defensives and where, okay, look at how much damage this is going out, right? So much damage, pulsing damage. Um, this is where everybody needs to use uh, your defensive and everyone has obviously already used them, uh, but your healer basically needs to pop something at this point. A lot of damage at this point. I think like they will eventually maybe nerf this uh, yeah, boss in terms of like the HPS required, not boss, this mini boss dragon in terms of the HPS that's required. So after that, you have more RP, right? And they will just run over to the, this wall and they would break down the wall to the right. And then you can take the pathway. And then there's a bit more RP, a lot of RP at this point, yes. Um, you run over to basically this wall and you just wait for more RP to happen. I'm going to forward here. Okay, you can see Chromie doing the RP here, right? Onto the wall, eventually the wall breaks and then you will come to the very final boss, uh, which I will now discuss how to do, right? Final boss, Iridicron. So Iridicron, how do you do it? Well, Iridicron is in the air. You can tank the boss with a range ability. The boss comes down to the ground. And this is where you need to start positioning the boss. So how do you do it? Um, the first thing is Infinity Ops. And this is the most critical mechanic in the entire boss fight. The most important thing that you need to learn about this boss fight is how to deal with the Ops. So the idea is this. The Ops, when they land on the ground, they do AoE damage to the entire group. At the same time, 
when the AoE damage goes out, it puts a stacking debuff on you, where if the next orb goes out while you have the debuff currently active on you, you take amplified damage from the second orb exploding. The debuff, however, doesn't last that long. So the idea is that you want to let one orb explode first, everybody takes the debuff, let the debuff time out, then the second orb can hit the ground and do its AoE again. So how do you do that? The idea is that whenever you're standing on the swirly of the descending orb, you actually slow the orb's descent to the ground. So the idea is that when there's a pair of orbs like that, and there's always only a pair, you assign someone to stand on one of the orbs and nobody else touches the other orb. You just let the other orb fall to the ground gradually and naturally. So see what happens here, right? We'll play it out. We assign the chamois to basically soak all our orbs. The chamois then stands on this orb over here and lets this orb just descend very quickly to the ground, explodes, right? Everybody gets this arcane debuff. It lasts for three seconds. Meanwhile, the chamois continues to stand in this orb that slows it down. By the time the next orb explodes, the debuff you can see has fallen off everyone's uh, unit frame and it's as simple as that. So you can let the next one explode and the debuff then goes out again from the second one. So that's how you resolve the orb mechanic. It's very important. This is the most important thing to do properly in this entire fight and you need to do it throughout all the phases. So rewinding a bit here. The boss will also do summon infinite keepers. The moment the boss summons ads, you want to swap immediately to the ads, right? At the start, it's about ad management. And the boss also does its frontal called Temporal Breath. Basically, it's a frontal that does damage. At the same time, it leaves a dot on you. Whoever gets hit, usually the tank, um, they will continue to take down magic damage, right? So just take note of that. It hits pretty hard on uh, Tyrannical Weeks. So you can see what the Keeper ad was trying to do here. The Keeper ad was trying to do Chrono Burn on people. You can see it places this Chrono Burn debuff on the Demon Hunter. Essentially, it's a dot that is on the Demon Hunter. It can be dispelled. So um, over here, it also does Infinite Blast. This is just a simple single target, like, you know, magical nuke on someone. At the same time, you can see that Deos then does the second pair of Infinity Ops. Again, you can see my Shami basically standing in one of them. Everyone else just simply ignores. Um, and then you have the frontal from the tank that is going to come real soon. Um, so you just be prepared for that. You can see over here, right? So make sure you have some form of mitigation. I have Iron Buck on me from the Druid. Um, and then you have more ops spawning, more keepers, and it just rinses and repeats. At this point in time, it's just, it's just a hectic fight. I'm just letting you play it out at full speed, right? And see the Chrono Burn is currently on the Druid. So lots of like, um, you know, things to heal for the healer, right? So the healer dispels himself, else the dot just kind of hurts. Um, and then as a tank, just be prepared for the Temporal Breath. That's where my Celestial Blue came in handy. Um, but you want to nuke the ads ASAP. It's really important. Um, and all these while, while you're moving, make sure to track where the infinity ops are spawning. So uh, that's really important. Towards the end of this phase, he spawns multiple ads, right? Everyone moves away from, uh, you can see, I think the demon hunter got clipped there by the frontal, which is unfortunate. But basically you want to burst down while the ads ASAP, really important, right? Sim simply because like there's two ads, so you got to pick one and focus. And then Chrono Lord Deos eventually flies into the air. And uh, you need to continue to do mechanics, work on the two ads. Um, you can see like whenever the ads uh, continue to keep the portal open, like there can be more stuff that spawns from the portal. So just be careful of that, right? Just need to be aware of that. Once you kill both ads though, right? See what happens. Stage two happens, right? It's a stage two lot of the infinite. So in stage two, when the boss is below 20%, the second phase starts. Basically, there'll be ground puddles that will permanently, um, you know, kind of spawn and you need to be very careful about um, you know, where those things basically land. You can see all these puddles that spawn on the ground. Yep, those are space denial. Um, you gotta move the hell away from them. And usually at this point in time, it's worth using Bloodlust because it's a race to the finish, right? Eventually the entire room uh, will just be, you know, filled with stuff. You just need to be very careful. At the same time, you have infinity orbs that makes it challenging, right? Maybe because you're a designated soaker, imagine like he's far away from all the orbs. So you need to basically, um, ensure that someone is assigned as the backup soap on the infinity ops. At the same time, you have more space denial from the boss. Normally you want to start at one side of the room and then you eventually move to the other side of the room. What makes it even more difficult is thanks to its, um, you know, frontal damage that continues to go on the tank. The healer needs to make sure that this, that it can never be cut off from the tank by those like puddles that it spawn, right? So you can see infinite corruption happens very often. This is where it spawns the swirlies on the ground. It basically, um, you know, does more space denial. So there's a lot of things going on. It's a very messy part of this fight, right? You can see we already lost someone there. Um, and yeah, the idea is that you want to try and kill the boss before the boss fills the entire room with sand. 
Um, so more infinity orbs. So you can see, imagine we assign the Shami to soak and the Shami dies, right? And then someone forgets to soak, the fight is over. So there's a couple of things to remember. Dodge swirlies, soak the orbs in the second phase. But you can see the second phase is way more intense, right? Because people might be running out of range from one another from the healer and the healer is struggling to keep up. And um, I just, all I'll say is that you just want to make sure that you stick together as a group and move around the room. But eventually, Lord Day also die and you would basically be done with the keystone. And so that's everything you need to know about Murazon's Rise. If you found this guide helpful, smash that subscribe button. More such guides coming your way. You don't want to miss that. A shout out to my Patreon subscribers. Good luck in the keystone. See you soon.